Shalom. Shalom. Uh, we're going to be looking at the four beasts of Daniel. These four beasts or the prophetic kingdoms that were to come and rule up until the end of the world when Yahshua Mashiach will come and destroy all their works and bring in his dominion. Uh, it was gracious. We had the opportunity to look at the ten horns of the modern times. So we're going back to look at the four beasts to understand how the world history, to see how it came to modern time. And also for encouragement to see that Ahaya is Allah, that what he had spoken came to pass, and what he has spoken will come to pass. Right. So it's all for our encouragement. All right. I'm going to start at Daniel chapter 2. This is in the days of the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Ahaya sent him a dream, showed him a vision of a statue, which was a similitude of the four beasts that come into the world. And we're looking at how Daniel was given the interpretation by Allah Hayim and shown what was to come so that we can see what happened and also see what is coming. I start in Daniel chapter 2 verse 26 to verse 45. We're jumping into the story. When you have time, you can start at the beginning of the chapter 2 and go from the beginning of it. The king had a dream. None of his, he had magicians, sorcerers, soothsayers, and Chaldeans. None of them could interpret the dream. And they had to go get one of the children of Israel. And the interpretations belonging to Allah Hayim, even as Joseph right. told the king of Egypt in his time. So he had to go get a Hebrew. And Ahaya sent the true understanding of the vision. And we're jumping into the story here in Daniel 2 and 26. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Bethsazar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? What was interesting, the king, he would not tell his dream. He, right. he wanted to confirm that it was the spirit of the holy Allah Hayams that's in the person interpreting the dream. He said, you tell me the dream. I'm not going to tell you. You tell me what I see. Because right. he wanted to make sure this wasn't a false prophet nor a false interpretation. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men and astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, show unto the king. But there are the Allahim in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king of Nebuchadnezzar. What shall be in the latter days? Thy dream and the vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. And you can see the humility of Daniel. So you can see that he was operating in the fruits of the Spirit. All right, All right continue. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. All right, so we have the head of gold, chest of silver. Right. What is it? The arms of silver and the chest. The arms of silver. Mm -hmm. uh, those gold was his, his uh, head of gold. Mm -hmm. Uh, his breast and his arms of silver. Mm -hmm. So his breast and arms of silver. His belly and his thighs of brass. His belly and thighs of brass. His legs of iron. His feet part iron and part of clay. So the iron is the fourth kingdom. And notice at the end of the fourth kingdom, his feet, though it's a part of the fourth kingdom, there's an extra part that's going to come with it. All right? Continue, please. Thou sawest till that stone was cut out without hands which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. All right, so that stone is going to destroy the whole image. Continue. Then was the iron, the clay, and the brass, and the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And it's interesting you see that that stone that broke the feet destroyed the whole image, the whole idol, right. which shows that these Four kingdoms, though four different kingdoms, they were still operating under the same evil spirit. Right. And that stone, which is the stone that the builders refused, <laughs> destroyed it all. Right. 
and is going to bring peace on earth and end. All right, continue. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we would tell the interpretation thereof before the king. All right. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the Elohim of heaven have given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the heaven have he given into thy hand, and have made thee ruler over them all. Thou art his head of gold. Thou art this head of gold. So there we see Ahaya let the king of Babylon have his dominion. And if you're familiar with world history, you're well aware that that was a true event. And Babylon did reign for a time. It's in our records and it's in the records of the nations. All right. So we have the king of Babylon. That's the first beast. All right. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. Now this next kingdom, remember this was the chest and arms of silver. And it's interesting because you have to have two arms. And this signifies the Medo-Persian Empire. Because they were two nations that had to come together to have that dominion. But they were not as glorious, quote unquote, as the dominion of the king of Babylon. Right. And another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And what's interesting, that brass kingdom, that was the kingdom of Grecia. It started with Alexander the Greek. And it went into his four generals that he split them onto it was Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. That he split the uh, what was then the known world under his dominion. That was the kingdom of the Grecians, which is the third kingdom. And then the fourth, what did it say on the fourth one? The fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdue of all things. And that fourth kingdom was going to be very powerful and subdue all things. Right. That is the fourth beast, Rome. And they did. They were very powerful when you read the book of First Maccabees. It tells you, I think it's First Maccabees chapter eight. If I am not mistaken, it tells you that Rome was conquering they were, everybody. They were vicious. They were subduing everybody, taking everybody over. They're still doing it to this day. All right, continue. And as iron that breaketh all things, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And where thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with Murray clay. Now this is very interesting. Notice, it's, the similitude is very key. The end of your leg is your feet. So in the end of the dominion of this fourth beast is going to be iron mixed with clay. Now, we're going to read and see what does that actually mean? Who is this iron? It's very important to pay attention to what's being shown, the interpretation of this dream. Because clay, we know man came from the dust of the earth in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. But who is this iron? What is this showing us? All right. Verse 42. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. How many toes do we have? Ten toes. Ten toes. This is the ten horns. The next verse is coming up is going to give good understanding on what this iron is that's mixing with this Murray clay. And Think whereas thou sawest iron mixed with Murray clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to the other, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Now, this was the key verse that we have to read again. Please read that again. Verse 43. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with Murray clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Who is they? Right. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. They are not the children of men that's being spoken of. That's right. Because they're going to mix themselves with the seed of men. That's right. This is speaking of the fallen angels coming down, showing that the fourth beast, the end of his dominion, is going to be the fallen angels ruling. And then this ties right into the book of Revelation 17, telling how the ten horns will give their power unto the beast. That's right. 
This is full angelic takeover. And then they're going to be ruling as they did in the days of Noah, as Yahshua prophesied in Matthew chapter 24. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. It's very clear that this is someone separate from the children of men. So that's showing that the fallen angels will be ruling in the end. All right? All right. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the Elohim of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So the fallen angels are going to, to show themselves and have their dominion, and, that, and when they come, that stone is going to come and destroy their works. That's right. All right? For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron and the brass and the clay and the silver and the gold, the great Elohim hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is short. And it is certain. We've seen everything that was told has already happened thus far. That's right. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome has their dominion right now. And is heading into some very dark times as these ten toes, this iron mixing itself with the seed of men, is going to show itself and have its dominion under the beast. And we look at Daniel 7. To continue on looking at these four beasts, Daniel 7, verse 1 to 12. Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and vision of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. And the four great beasts came up from the sea diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld to the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Now that lion, as we know from the prior dream to King Babylon, that's Nebuchadnezzar. Right. That's the Babylonian Empire. And the interpretation of the wings... That's how he flew in and took over. Swiped up there. Right. Swiped up everything. Just as an eagle comes as a predator, he right. swooped in and took over the world. And also how he was plucked and he, a man's heart was given to him. He, when you read the book of Daniel, that literally happened because he was lifted up in pride. And he got humbled. And he was made like unto a beast. He didn't even get to live in the actual kingdom that he was in. He had to go off into the... Uh, bushes to live amongst the animals because he had got lifted up in pride so that what Daniel saw actually came to pass and so that's the Babylon Empire and then the next one and behold another beast a second like to a bear and it raised up itself on one side and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it with the bear what happened with him was he was raised up on one side because the Persian Empire was stronger than the Medes Empire. Right. That's why there was more strength on that side of the beast. So you can see what the scriptures show. It's literally telling us of the events that happened. And the three ribs. The three ribs were Egypt, Libya, and Babylon. Those are who they took down to take their dominion. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. And they were vicious. Right. The Persians took over. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. And the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now this beast, the Grecian Empire. Right. And it's interesting that they had four wings, because this showing they swooped in even faster than the Babylonians. Right. And the four heads are the four generals under Alexander. This is Lysimachus, Cassander, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. When you look into our history, you can see about those empires. Now, the Grecians is interesting. If we look at the book of Jasher, something interesting happened. The Grecians, by their bloodline, the Grecian people are the children of Javan, which are the Japhetites. But what we're going to see is something happened in history that is not talked about. The Grecians that took over 
at the time of Alexander, they were not ruled by the children of Javan. They were ruled by the children of Edom. So this is when Edom would have his dominion and break the yoke of his brothers. It's right. talked about in Genesis chapter 27 when the blessings were given to Jacob and Esau by their father Isaac. If you look at Jasher chapter 10, verse 13, you can confirm who the Grecians are as in the literal land of Greece and that bloodline, not who ruled at the time of Alexander, but who the bloodline was. Right. And the children of Javan are the Javanim, who dwell in the land of Macedonia. This is the old word for Macedonia. We wanted to confirm by scriptures who the actual land of Javan was. This is Macedonia, what is essentially known as Greece. So we can confirm that the Grecians, which are the children of Javan, when you see Javan, the definition would also show that it says the Grecians there. We can also see in the definitions of the words that Chittim is also used to identify the Grecians and the Romans. If we look at the concordance number 3794 for the definition of Chittim. A Kittite or Cyphrotite? A uh, Cyphrotite because they apply it to Cyprus's work. Hence an islander in See, general. The islander, they use it for is a general term, right? That is, the Greeks or Romans on the shores opposite Palestine. So there we see they use it for the Greeks and the Romans. Now, let's look at Jasher chapter 10, verse 16, so we can see the original people of Chittim. Jasher chapter 10, verse 16. And the children of Chittim are the Roman, who dwell in the valley of Canopia by the river Tibru. Now, it gets interesting here. There's a Grecian bloodline. There's the Roman, quote-unquote, Chittim bloodline. But the rulers of those lands, by the time of their dominion in the kingdom of Alexander the Greek, was under Edom. We're going to look at the scriptures and see how that came to be. In Genesis chapter 27, about verse 38 to 40, it tells how Esau was given his blessing, and his blessing said, when he shall have his dominion. The word dominion there is H7300, and it actually means to wander away, to roam. So it was foretelling, when Edom shall leave, he shall break his brother's yoke. His children left the land of Edom and went off into Egypt, and then they went into North Africa, and then they went over into Chittim. And we're going to look a little bit at that to see that the Edomites were who were actually ruling over the children of Chittim when the Grecians and when the Romans got their dominion. In Jasher chapter 17 verse 1. And in those days, in the 91st year of the life of Abram, the children of Chittim made war with the children of Tubal. Tubal dwelt in what is called Tuscany today according to the scriptures. For when Ahiah had scattered the sons of men upon the face of the earth, the children of Chittim went and embodied themselves in the plain of Canopia, and they built themselves cities there and dwelt by the river Tibru. All right, so from verse 10 and 16, we know the Chittim or the Romans. This is all in Italy, right? Now, let's jump to chapter 61, verse 23 to 25. So that was the ancient times. Now we move forward a little bit to when Zepho, the grandson of Esau, came over to Chittim and became their ruler. And under him, they brought all the islands, the surrounding islands, under the dominion of Chittim. Chapter 61 of Jasher, verse 23. And at the revolution of the year, the troops of Africa continued coming to the land of Chittim to plunder as usual. And Zepho, son of Eliphaz, heard their report. And he gave orders concerning them, and he fought with them. And they fled before him, and he delivered the land of Chittim from them. And the children of Chittim saw the valor of Zepho. And the children of Chittim resolved, and they made Zepho king over them. And he became king over them. And while as he reigned, they went to subdue the children of Tubal and all the surrounding islands. So they went and took over all the islands in the Mediterranean took over that whole area. Now you see how the whole area is called Chittim. Right. When Edom came there, his lineage became king there, and they subdued the whole area. Made right. one land. Right, continue. 
And the king therefore went at their head, and they made war with Tubal and the islands, and they subdued them. And when they returned from the battle, they renewed his government for him, and they built for him a very large palace for his royal habitation and seat. And they made a large throne for him, and Zephyr reigned over the whole land of Chittim and over the land of Italia fifty years. So now we see Edom's lineage is ruling over the land of Chittim and all the islands there, the children of Javan. So you can see how it became all encompassing. Right. When they say Chittim, they apply it to the Grecians and the Romans. Right. Continue to Joshua 74, verse 6 and 7. And in those days died Janus, king of the children of Chittim. And they buried him in his temple, which he had built for himself in the plain of Canopia, for a residence. And Latinus reigned in the state. In the twenty-second year of the reign of Mushi over the children of Cush, Latinus reigned over the children of Chittim forty-five years. So there we see this back in the days of Mushi, Moses. Jump to chapter 90, verse 1 through 11. At that time, in the fifth year after the children of Israel had passed over Jordan, after the children of Israel had rested from their war with the Canaanites, at that time great and severe battles arose between Edom and the children of Chittim. And the children of Chittim fought against Edom. And Abneus, king of Chittim, went forth in that year, that is in the thirty-first year of his reign, and a great force with him of the mighty men of the children of Chittim. And he went to Seir to fight against the children of Esau. And Hadad, king of Edom, heard of his report, and he went forth to meet him with a heavy people and strong force and engaged in battle with him in the field of Edom. And the hand of Chittim prevailed over the children of Esau. And the children of Chittim slew of the children of Esau two and twenty thousand men. And all the children of Esau fled from before him. And the children of Chittim pursued them, and they reached Hadad, king of Edom, who was running before them, and they caught him alive, and brought him to Abinah, Abinus, king of Chittim. And Abinus ordered him to be slain, and Hadad, king of Edom, died in the forty-eighth year of his reign. And the children of Chittim continued their pursuit of Edom, and they smote them with a great slaughter, and Edom became subject to the children of Chittim. And the children of Chittim ruled over Edom, and Edom became under the hand of the children of Chittim, and became one kingdom from that day. And there we see, there were one kingdom, Chittim and Edom brought together. Alright, All right. so if we look at Daniel chapter 5, verse 25 to 31. And this is the writing that was written, Mene Mene Tikel of Harsin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, Elohim, hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tikel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. So there we see literally, just as prophecy said, from Babylonians to the Medo Persians. <laughs> right? Alright, and then it also said there would be, after the Medes, there would be another beast, the leopard. This is the Grecian Empire. Alright? Let's transition to Daniel chapter 8, verse 15 to 22. It's amazing that Alahayim testified of it right before it came to pass. Right. And then the Right Just up. like that. And now we're looking at Daniel eight fifteen to 22, the angel giving the interpretation of what was to come between the Medes and the Grecians. Daniel chapter 8, verse 15. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. Then, behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Ulai, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. And he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. And he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground. 
but he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. And we remember the two arms of silver. Right. So two horns showing there. Remember they were the beasts were stronger on one side because the Persians were stronger than the Medes. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. This is Alexander, what they call the Macedonian. Right. Alexander is actually an Edomite. Right. All right, continue. Now that being broken, where four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And this literally happened. Alexander, that horn that was strong, took over and destroyed the Medo-Persian Empire. And out of him came the four, his four generals, as we had spoken of before. And we're going to actually see in the scriptures that these events came to pass. We look at First Maccabees chapter 1, verse 1 to 9. It's interesting because Alexander is referred to as a Macedonian in the scriptures. Right. And also there was a man in the story of Esther called Haman. They used the term Macedonian in the Apocrypha, but in the book of Esther, he was called an Agagite. Which, I was about to say that. Right. I was thinking about. Yeah, he was an Agagite, which is the seed of Amalek. I have graces. We get to do a full sit down and look at how Esau transitioned over to Chittim. But here continue with Maccabees. So it said in the book of Daniel 8 that he would destroy the Medes and out of him four would come and have their dominion but not in his power because Alexander had his kingdom in one rulership. Right. It was together but under his four generals they all separated off and did their own thing. Right. And we're going to read about that here in Maccabees chapter 1 verse 1 to 9. First Maccabees chapter 1 verse 1. And it happened after that Alexander the son of Philip the Macedonian who came out of the land of Chittim, had smitten Darius king of the Persians and Medes, that he reigned in his stead, the first over Greece. Literally as the scripture said it would be. <laughs> Continue. And made many wars and won many strongholds and slew the kings of the earth, and went through to the ends of the earth, and took spoil of many nations, insomuch that the earth was quiet before him, whereupon he was exalted and his heart was lifted up. And he gathered a mighty strong host and ruled over countries and nations and kings who became tributaries unto him. And after these things he fell sick and perceived that he should die. Wherefore he called his servants, such as were honorable, and had been brought up with him from his youth, and parted his kingdom amongst them while he was yet alive. And these were his four generals, Cassandra, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. So Alexander reigned twelve years and then died, and his servants bear rule every one in his place. Yeah, right. So they all had their dominions in different areas that was allotted to them. Ptolemy was given Egypt, Cassander had the area of Macedonia, and Seleucus had Mesopotamia, and Lysimachus was in the area of Asia Minor, India, over on that side. All right. And what did they do? And his servants bear rule every one in his place. And after his death, they all put crowns upon themselves. So did their sons after them many years, and evil were multiplied in the earth. So this is where things, times got worse and worse in the time as they're moving forward. So we have what they did. We see now that we have the Grecian Empire, right? right. Just as the scriptures said, and then the scriptures said that well, there's going to come a fourth beast.
And this is Rome. And it's in the scriptures when we look at 1 Maccabees chapter 8. 1 Maccabees chapter 8 verse 1. Now Judas had heard of the Romans, that they were mighty and valiant men, and such as would lovingly accept all that joined themselves unto them, and make a league of amity with all that came unto them, and that they were men of great valor. It was told him also of their wars and noble acts which they had done among the Galatians, and how they had conquered them and brought them under tribute. And what they had done in the country of Spain for the winning of the mines of the silver and gold which is there, and that by their policy and patience they had conquered all the place, though it were very far from them. And the kings also that came against them from the uttermost part of the earth, till they had discomfited them, and given them a great overthrow, so that the rest did give them tribute every year. Besides this, how they had discomforted in battle Philip and Perseus, king of Chittim, with others that lifted up themselves against them had overcome them. How also Antiochus, the great king of Asia, had came against them in battle, having a hundred and twenty elephants with horsemen and chariots, and a very great army was discomforted by them. And how they took him alive and covenanted that he and such as reigned after him should pay a great tribute and give hostages and that which was agreed upon. In the country of India and Midia and Lydia and of the goodliest countries which they took of him and gave to king Eumenes. However, how the Grecians had determined to come and destroy them and that they have acknowledged their own sin against them a certain captain and fighting with them slew many of them and carried away captive their wives and their children and spoiled them and took possession of their lands and pulled down their strongholds and brought them to be their servants unto this day. So now we see the Romans overcame the Grecians right. and dwelling in the time of the fourth beast now. So now you have an understanding of the fourth beast and I have be gracious we continue learning more things. Right. Shalom. So,